The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, very large object ringing Barnard Star turns out to be a VLD, or very large donut, with a very large cop reaching for it, which is what the constellation Orion actually is. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have part one of an interview with Mike Massa talking about the new book he's written with John Ringo. This is a continuation of the Black Tide Rising science-based zombie series, and it takes place near the beginning of John Ringo's solo series opener, Under a Graveyard Sky. This book is called The Valley of Shadows, and Mike will tell us much more about it in a moment. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now, here's the news. We got a couple of hard hitting hard covers with plenty of action, story, and cool speculation for November. First, we have The Valley of Shadows by John Ringo and Mike Massa. We'll hear a lot more about that in a moment. From his corner office on the 44th floor of the Bank of America Tower on Wall Street, Tom Smith, Global Managing Director for Security, can see the Statue of Liberty, Battery Park, and a ravening zombie horde. Good thing Smith, late of the Australian Special Forces, isn't a man to give up easily. But saving civilization is going to take a lot more than the traditional banking toolbox of lawyers, guns, and money. Smith needs infected human spinal tissue to formulate a vaccine, and he needs it by the truckload. To get it, he will have to forge a shady alliance with the politicians of the city of New York and some of its less savory entrepreneurs. Also out in November is A Pillar of Fire by Night by Tom Crapman. Hey, this is book number seven in the popular Carrera military science fiction series. Carrera's held off his enemies coming by sea from the north in the process dealing the naval and amphibious forces of the Zong Empire a stinging defeat. The Zongs won't soon forget the blood-stained waters and the heaped bodies on the shores of Balboa's Isla Real. Now, though, his adopted country of Balboa is under assault from the east, from the south, and from the west, from the air, and even from space. The Zong, smarting from the butchery around the island, have bounced back and forced a lodgment east of the capital. Their lodgment is still a building, but when it is done, Carrera can expect several hundred thousand brave and determined Zong to show up on his barely defended flank. It's beginning to look like the game is up for Balboa and Patricio Carrera, but Carrera has been planning this war for 15 years. He certainly hopes his enemies think they're winning. The Valley of Shadows by John Ringo and Mike Massa and The Pillar of Fire by Night by Tom Crapman are available now at booksellers everywhere. This is the first part of an interview with Mike Massa talking about The Valley of Shadows. Part two will be available on next week's podcast. I want to welcome Mike Massa to the podcast. Hello, Mike. Hi, Tony. How are you doing this evening? Pretty good. Um, Mike Massa has lived a diverse and adventurous life, including stints as a Navy SEAL officer. Yeah. Investment. Yep, yep. No, I'm sorry. I was just giving the traditional uh, SEAL uh, greeting, which is hoo ya. Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. <laughs> An international advance, investment banker, do they have a call? And... Uh, yes, it's called Show Me the Money. I see. And an internet technologist. Um, Mike is currently at a university cyber as uh, Mike is currently as a university cybersecurity researcher, consulted by governments, Fortune 500 companies, and high net worth families on issues of privacy, resilience, and disaster recovery. He lives. He has lived outside the U.S. for several years, plus military deployments, and has traveled to over 80 countries. He's the author of a bunch of short stories and now with John Ringo, the co-author of The Valley of Shadows, a new entry in the Black Tide Rising series, and the start of, I guess we could say, um, a, a sub-series, the Tom Smith sub-series. There's probably a name that we, you have for this the, the sub-series. That, and that book is out now. It's called The Valley of 
the Valley of Shadows, and it's at booksellers everywhere. Um, are we calling this series something, or or do we just? Uh, John's been referring it to uh, as the the second half of the uh, Smith family Robinson. You know, hearkening back to the the core protagonists in the first four novels, the, the Smith family. Uh, Tom and his daughters and his spouse, uh, Stacy and Sophia and Faith. Sorry, Steve and Sophia, Stacy and Faith. And so here we're following uh, Tom Smith uh, on his adventures ashore. And uh, this book takes us back to the start of the series so that uh, if readers are interested, um, they can pick this one up first. And uh, it also rewards the existing readers of the series as well with lots of, of callbacks and, uh, and inside jokes. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of a companion volume to Under a Graveyard Sky, as, as far as timeline goes, right? That's right. The uh, this book in its entirety um, basically addresses the events and is is um, framed during the first half of Under a Graveyard Sky, so right up until the fall of New York. Yeah, but. Before we start talking about uh, the Valley of the Shadows, um, I you know it's kind of interesting to hear your background and uh, and and I want to hear about it and um, how you came to to be writing with John, uh, Navy Seal, former Navy Seal officer, um, investment banker. Yeah, I, uh, I did. I was in, on uh, in the military for twelve years. I was in the teams for eight of that. Uh, did lots and lots of deployments. That's where I, I continued to add to my existing list of countries that I traveled to, although many of them uh, I didn't have the chance to get my passport stamped, if you know what I mean. And I um, uh, first read a John Ringo novel while I was on active duty as a part of his uh, Pauline universe. So this is back in the uh, late 90s, actually. And uh, I was so pleased, so tickled with what I'd read, I reached out to John and and it was the first uh, communication of what's become a, a really good, strong, and enduring friendship. And so um, much later, when I relocated uh, to New York and then London, or after I got out of the military, of course, and I was working as a, as a banker, um, I was keeping John abreast of my, my adventures. And they were sort of a different flavor of adventures than they'd been when I was on active duty and I was a SEAL. Um, and uh, this is during the time that uh, John was writing Ghost, and so he, <laughs> we, uh, we swapped some yarns and uh, had some in-person uh, adventures together while we were at a few cons, and he was sort of framing Ghost in his head, and that story is well known to your, your listenership. Um, but then later, um, much later, he conceived of Under a Graveyard Sky, and uh, he invited me to contribute a story. And I was uh, delighted and amazed. And uh, that was in Black Tide Rising anthology. Yeah, the the Black Tide Rising anthology, the first one. Yeah, that was cool. That was like an anchor novella in that book. It was it was good stuff. That I'm glad you cool. liked it. I I loved writing it, and uh, it could have gone a lot longer. I uh, I probably need to learn to write a shorter short story, but that could have easily gone, you know, thirty or forty thousand words. Keeping it to under twenty. Um, was an, uh, a good exercise, and, and I uh, got lots of good guidance from both uh, John Ringo and, uh, and his editor, Gary Poole. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, I thought that I saw some call-outs. You were talking about um, some inside call-outs and such to, um, to the series. Um, I thought I saw some ghost ones, too, in there, um, particularly like the, the bomb that blew up somewhere in the ocean, uh, that, wasn't that a Mike Harmon thing? That was a Mike Harmon thing. So uh, after I had given John the first eighty or 90,000 words of, uh, of this novel, um, he read it through and he goes, you know, I've got an idea that would allow us in the future at some point to collaborate maybe on a crossover between these two universes. And, and nothing's written in stone, and it's currently just an idea, but uh, the, um, the astute readers – of the EARC immediately seized on a couple of these references to events that happen in the ghost universe. Yeah. So you, it, it, to structure that. Yeah. It's like a, it, you're, it's like the, um, it's, it's the black tide rising and the, uh, the Kildar books are coming together and there are in one universe, it seems, which is very cool. It's, 
a, it, it's a really exciting concept. Um, on an earlier podcast here on the Bain Free Radio Hour, uh, John had shared that he is, uh, previously we kept it tightly under wraps, but he shared that he is uh, in discussions uh, with me and we're framing what the, uh, the next follow-on books in the Ghost series, the Mike Harmon universe, might look like and whether or not that would include um, this crossover opportunity that we, we planted the hooks for in this novel. Yeah, that'll be that'll be great, and you're just the writer for that. Should it come to fruition, I think his fans will, will really love it. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. So um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about was um, it, you said that, so your dad was a helicopter pilot that picked up some of the space capsules? Yeah, my uh, so my my father who um, who passed recently was a uh, a World War II Korea and um, Vietnam uh, naval aviator veteran, and one of the things that happened after World War II is the Navy needed a lot less airplanes and a lot fewer pilots. So if you didn't want to fly a different airplane they needed, they just they they show you the door. And Dad wanted to stay in, so he ended up becoming a test pilot, and he met. Um, Igor Sikorsky, and mm-hmm. uh, transitioned to helicopters, of course, and in the course of doing that, um, participated in the space program. He recovered, I want to say it was Mercury 6 or Mercury 5, I think it was Gus Grissom. Um, then he picked up Gemini 7, uh, and I forget who was in that one. I think Chaffee was one of them. If I don't recall, I have to go back and look at my notes. It was on board USS either Ariskany or Kearsarge. And then later he picked up one of the early Apollos that was a test article that didn't have any astronauts inside it. And the neat thing is that we have the uh, no-audio, handheld, 8-millimeter color film that he took or his crew took from the aircraft while they're conducting these operations. And we've, we've submitted that and some other artifacts to the, aerospace, the National Air and Space Museum uh, for their collection, although they have a wealth of things. This is a, you know, a very minor contribution, but I don't want something like that to get lost. Yeah, sure. I mean, that sounds like it belongs in the Smithsonian or the, or yeah, that that wing of it. That's, that's I still have really these cool. uh, original tan cloth uh, aviation. I guess you'd call it skull cap with the little earpieces that hold his uh, his, his uh, headphones in place for when he was flying uh, an open cockpit trainer in the in the forties. And that's on my desk in uh, in my office and here in the uh, nation's capital. So I think of my dad every day. And in fact, in the in the um, hardback version of the book, which is, uh, is out now, uh, you will find that um, John's usual dedication uh, to a very special person and also an aviator uh, is uh, joined by a dedication by, to my dad from me that uh, John very graciously allowed me to insert. Yeah, that's excellent. Very, very cool. So, um, well, let's go back to, let's talk about the book. Um, what is... Um, how did you and John conceive of doing this, first of all? What's the origin story of actually writing the thing? I'm pretty sure I've... Have I read a portion of this um, somewhere? You may have. So the uh, John really liked um, and, and has said very... has given me very fulsome praise for the Battle of the Burtz story in the BTR anthology. And not long after that anthology came out, I received a message from the publisher, from Tony Weisskopf, and she asked me, Michael, when am I going to, you know, when are you going to suggest or when are you going to propose a book concept um, and, and submit a candidate? And I said, well, I've got a few ideas. John and I have talked a little bit about uh, a collaboration. She says, great, bring it to me. And so we wrote, a, we wrote an outline, about a 40-page outline, and she goes, too long, give it to me in, in a page. I'm like, right, you got it, in a page. And I went through a feverish 24-hour period of, of cutting 39 pages of my outline into one. <laughs> and that turned into a contract, which uh, we very ceremoniously signed at LibertyCon 30, I believe, in the summer of 2016. And it's captured on, uh, digitally both in stills and movie for posterity. And uh, John and I felt that once the Smith family had evacuated the water, in the first half of Under a Graveyard Sky, there was this big gulf. What happened to all those interesting characters that John had created, um, secondary characters in the first book, that he'd left ashore? What, what happens when you're ashore and you can't escape? And moreover, uh, what was happening 
from the point of view of the of the bank, Bank of the Americas, that John uh, John's protagonists were working with through the first uh, the first half of the first book, and it was a natural fit because I I worked in a very large international investment bank and I worked on the the security and the anti fraud, the money laundering. I should say the anti money laundering. To be careful how I phrase that, anti money laundering. Uh, mm-hmm. and the uh, physical security, executive security, crisis response, disaster recovery, all of it. And one of the things that I had managed for the bank had been uh, the swine flu epidemic of, I believe that was 2009, now a decade passed. And so I was able to draw on, on really how the bank responded, and the banks work together, they collaborate. They don't, you know, for emergencies like that, are, that are global, they tend to share information. And I gave John an outline of, you know, how critical it is to respond to an emergency in a way that keeps the financial engines of the world functioning to allow the economy in turn to function, to allow the businesses and researchers and individuals that will find the cure, manufacture a vaccine, distribute the medicine, and transport the patients, uh, and keep all that big engine working. Because without this, without this digital make-believe money that we all uh, we all agree to believe in, it all comes to a screeching halt, especially in the areas of um, liquid fuels and uh, highly perishable groceries. Um, those things are all the, act- the financial activities that make it possible for you to go to the ATM, fill your gas tank, buy a gallon of milk, fill your prescription. Those all depend on daily interbank uh, loans of money in very large sums. And if you can't do that, then the businesses literally cannot operate. When I was living in um, New York during Hurricane Sandy and Irene, the uh, the first hurricane radically stressed the liquid fuels portion of the infrastructure because the actual distilleries as well as the landing places where the crude oil comes ashore were affected by the storm. They had no power. And if you don't have liquid fuel to run a city, you've got a real problem. And so we came, we came we had, it got close enough that they were actually rationing fuel to people uh, to every other day uh, and rationing how much you could take because there simply wasn't enough to go around. So I simply extrapolated from those experiences and added a whole bunch more pressure, dropped a lot more disaster on top of my characters, and then let them find their way out of it. Yeah. The, I mean, until I, until I read uh, the book, I never had considered how – how integral and essential um, a bank is just to um, staving off uh, any <laughs> any apocalypse that might be on the way. Um, you really did a great job of um, of uh, you and John did a great job of of creating a dire sense of man. This bank needs to keep working, right? <laughs> it all goes for a ball of chalk really, really rapidly, and it's, it's a little terrifying how rapidly that occurs. I mean, we talked a bit about, okay, so who's best positioned to live without banks? And uh, John's vote was for uh, the Mennonites and the Amish um, and other uh, typically religious communities that have built on a, a culture of self-reliance and, um, and not relying on high tech. And they, they may not even notice other than the fact there may be looters uh, and, and increased uh, heightened amounts of, um, of criminality, they may not otherwise notice that the power turned off because they don't use it, and they don't need gas. They're using carriages and horses, et cetera, et cetera. The rest of us are not Mennonites. So <laughs> oh, no, we definitely aren't. And, and, of course, the other feature of, of John's uh, Black Tide Rising Universe is this extraordinarily virulent virus uh, the two-stage virus that he and uh, Dr. Rob Hansen um, dreamed up and that had to be uh, the explanations and the technical details behind it in the first book had to be substantially dumbed down in order for the, uh, the manuscript to be released and approved by, uh, by Rob's employers and, and some of his uh, colleagues at the CDC. But uh, suffice to say that it's a terrifying new idea, and if you accept some of the premises that John and Rob stipulates, a lot of what happens in the Graveyard Sky and now in Valley of Shadows, uh, it, it follows quite naturally. So, ex- explain that. What is this virus? How does it operate? What's it going? What is it doing to people? Uh, as the book, uh, as the book opens. So, uh, 
uh, John and I share a sort of disdain for the traditional um, shuffling magical zombie uh, that really is an undead person somehow magically animated. And he, he was just tired of the whole zombie trope. He decided to do it as realistically as he could. So he came up with the notion of a virus like an avian flu um, and imagined that someone could use uh, the evolving technology and science of synthetic biology to m- compel the virus to express not just a copy of itself, so you don't just get sick with the sniffles and the headache and the joint pain and, and, uh, and tummy trouble, but they, they blended it with a modified rabies virus that would attack uh, the parts of your brain that control higher thought, rational thought, and um, the ability to speak, and, and self-awareness, and all those higher brain functions that really make us what we are. So if you combine the, the virulence and the ease of spread, airborne spread of, say, avian influenza, with the dire results and consequences of a modified rabies virus, you now have something that looks a lot like a zombie. It's, the person's not dead, but in terms of their personality, the, the, the gestalt that made them who they are, they're not there anymore. And they're, they're to borrow the term, they're rapidly aggressive. Um, they, have, they don't have any social mores. They're, they're, each one is an alpha predator, and they work in a pack system. And they exist pretty much to find things and eat them and make more of themselves. Not, 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 not trying to spread the disease deliberately, but certainly um, blood-borne contact is one way that this disease spreads. And so if you get bit by a zombie you've got a really good chance of becoming a zombie. You know, the first stage of the virus that John worked out, uh, about 10% prompt mortality to this really powerful flu. Horrible, horrible flu, sort of like uh, the Spanish influenza of the, uh, the 1918 and, and, and so forth. Um, and then if you survive that, and 90% of people do, um, you've got about a 70% chance of losing your higher brain function and becoming uh, an infected, or as John calls them, a zombie. And uh, this... It, the, uh, the, the rate of spread uh, was really high at the start because John postulated that this was a man caused, this was a, 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 a created event. It was an artificial event that someone had created this virus and then spread it in, um, all over the place at once. So by the time the first group of people were sick, because there's a gestation period, an incubation period, um, it had already basically raced around the globe. So by the time you're aware of it, there's really you're going to have a hard time uh, fencing off places that are safe from places that are not. And it was a, it's a terrifying premise. Having, having worked in an industry where avian influenza and swine flu were both really serious uh, and things we worried a lot about, the notion of taking something that spreads as easily as swine flu is even more lethal than uh, avian influenza and for which there's no known vaccine and, and that Tamiflu don't, don't, won't work with was a terrifying thought. And so, of course, I wrote a book about it. <laughs> hmm. So, um, our protagonist, what's that? <laughs> you got to destroy the world. So, that's always fun. Um, so, uh, the protagonist, Tom, is the brother of Steve, uh, who is the main character, or one of the main characters, along with his daughter and wife in uh, the Black Tide Rising books that John wrote, Under Graveyard Sky, etc. Um, and uh, Tom is a, is a different sort of fellow than his brother. He is, for one thing, he's unmarried, right? Um, he's head of a corporate... Sec- yeah. Um, he's head of something like corporate security at, at a big bank. Um, that entails a lot of considerations about how investment banking works and in banks and uh it sounds like you're writing what you know mike <laughs> it, i'm i'm utterly guilty of that and um uh, and i think some readers will ask themselves how realistic is it that a character like tom smith would have access to these resources would have the sort of innate responsibility to think globally about a threat as unusual as this pandemic which isn't fully understood at the start of the book and I've, I've tried to explain uh, that investment banks uh, in, in the real world operate fairly sophisticated intel- intelligence departments, and their job is to look into the future and identify 
threats to the bank, threats to the banking, international banking system, and provide that, those estimates, those threats, those risks uh, to the people that run the banks and to the governments that those, those banks often serve, the markets where those banks operate. As an example, and they, they do things that can be really sophisticated, and then later they become sort of uh, the norm. As an example, there's a, an investment bank that I'll, I'll leave off their brand, but uh, this is during the, the period of Enron when day-to-day energy trading was a, was a multi-billion dollar business, and knowing what the supply of energy was going to be, of electricity on a given day was going to be, was a huge market advantage. So they hired, they, they had a, an intelligence unit, and they would go out with uh, FLIRS, which is a forward-looking infrared camera. It can basically see heat in the dark. And they would look at the power plants at the start of every day because that's when the power plants would either take units offline or bring units online. And they could count how many units there were. They could see how many were hot. They're getting turned on or warmed up. And how many were cold. They're dark blue in the FLIR. And that would give them an estimate for what the power supply in a given region was going to be. And indexed against how cold or how hot it was for the season, that gives them a good sense for how the trading was going to go that day. And it gave them a huge advantage. And this is... This is almost spy-level stuff, although very, very legal, because it's all public information. No one's trying to hide it. They just thought of it first. Now this is a, an accepted way of uh, predicting the market, and it's brought some stability to energy trading, uh, the intraday sort of prices for electricity. But that's an example of the kind of things that the intelligence department for a bank has to do. And so this, uh, I find it very credible. I did some of this stuff. The things that Tom Smith does in the book – are not unusual or exceptional until we get to the part where they begin manufacturing vaccine. And then I, I think then John and I took some liberties with the what ifs and asked ourselves, what would people do in, if they were really an extremist and there was no other solution set? And that's where we, you know, we begin to sort of get into the science fiction aspect. Yeah. So, um, who is Tom as a person, by the way? What's his background? How did he become? He's wearing Armani suits when we first meet him, um, if perhaps a little uncomfortably. Um, he is. He's a big guy. Uh, Tom Smith is a is a naturalized American citizen, but formerly uh, belonged a member of the Commonwealth. He was an Australian citizen, and as an Australian, he was in the Australian Special Air Service, which is the Australian version, if you will of America's um, uh, top tier or tier one special operations operators, like the British SAS, if you will. And um, in, in the, again, in the preface to the book, I, I call out a real-world event where there was a, a catastrophic, uh, in fact, there's an assass- a successful assassination attempt on a major uh, globally recognized banking figure. And when that happened in the real world, the banks in the real world, in our historical timeline, said, you know, the way we're doing security is not going to work. We actually need to up our security game. And in the real world, they began hiring people like Tom Smith. So having a guy like Tom at a bank in the security department reads like a convenient sort of Marty Sueism for uh, a book like this. But the reality is that a lot of banks, um, certainly a majority of the ones that I interacted with during my time in the industry, had... Uh, a strong proportion of veterans, specifically uh, special operations veterans, that had all sorts of contacts and networks and a sort of um, um, a sort of a, an outside-the-box way of thinking about problems uh, that traditional banks hadn't previously considered. And that's a really that's a, a very real um, dynamic that it still exists today. So I felt very comfortable writing about Tom. Uh, it was fun. Uh, you know, his, he, he has a sidekick in the book who's his head of intelligence, and a lot of that person's um, complaint, co- complaints and gripes and concerns were things that I had myself. So I'm not, you know, if people say, oh, you're writing yourself into this book, I'm like, well, if I am, you know, I'm the, uh, I'm the supporting character uh, that's working for Tom Smith, trying to remind him of what he can and can't do and what he should and shouldn't do and et cetera. So I, I sympathize a lot with a character in the book called Paul Rune, R-U-N-E Rune. Yeah, yeah, his um right guy. He, you know, he's he's all about I I signed the contract, I took the money, I took the salt if you will. Um and I'm going to fulfill my pledge to my employer. He you know, he brings that sort of uh that military flavor of loyalty to his corporate job. And a big part of this book is the his journey into 
How far will that take him? How far can that take him and still be productive? At what point does he have a larger set, a different set of of, uh, loyalties and concerns that he has to address? Yeah, because he's got um, his brother's family who he's very close with. Um, and, he, and early in the book, he has to make a call. Um, he's he's signed all these uh, non-disclosure agreements and such. But, um, you know, this is a, a world-changing event that he's facing. Um, does he tell them or not? And it's it's uh, it's no trivial decision. Um, you know, if he if he tells them and it's not the catastrophic end of the world, he isn't just out of a job. He's he's going to be in the who's go. So, yeah, the um, there are very strong rules, not just for competitive reasons, but to comply with the Securities and Exchange Commission in the real world. You can't go around sharing what's called non-public data because it gives people unfair advantages. It's, you know, it can lead to things like insider trading, which then leads you to uncomfortable invest, uh, interviews with the FBI and and times in front of grand juries and then uh, indictments. So. Bankers like to avoid those sorts of things. Yeah, so you better hope there's a zombie apocalypse if you decide to disclose such. Exactly. In fact, in John's first book, Under Graveyard Sky, again, at the very start of the book, the protagonist, um, Steve, has to decide, okay, I've gotten the no-kidding apocalypse code and I've got it confirmed. Do I, on, on just the say-so of one person, do I walk away from my life and take my family out of their lives? And you have to be ready uh, on, on, on a moment's notice, if you're really going to be serious about evading uh, an, uh, a disaster and having that first mover advantage that gets you in front of the bow wave, you got to be ready to do that. And it takes a special kind of person. And, and John's characters are those people. And, and so is Tom Smith, yeah. for that matter. So what is this, uh, this three-level threat? It, it, it goes through the book, um, especially the first part of the book, where we're, we're concerned about the levels of of threat response um the bronze silver gold um what what does that mean and how does it play in the book well so the the um in ascending order of bronze silver and gold they correspond to the significance the potential impact of a given event to the bank or it could be any industry but to the bank and really the origin of that is with uh, Scotland Yard, I believe in the 80s, used this system as they began to work with uh, the city of London, which was becoming, uh, in the first steps to becoming a global financial powerhouse. And bronze is, is the level of risk and the level of impact where the responders organize at a fairly junior or operational level and in a relatively limited or bounded geographical region. So if you had a tornado that affected a city and only hurt a handful of people, relatively speaking, um, and you could work around or plan around that so that the company operations were not going to be that disrupted, that would be a bronze-level event. If you had a regional issue um, that was going to actually impact the bank peripherally, let's say, or the other, you know, any commercial organization, emergency responders and so forth, that would be silver. But if you have a global event or an event of such a high impact, even if it's happening regionally, that it's felt, the impact is felt globally, especially on the markets, that becomes a gold event. And the seniority of the people that make it their business to not just respond, but to participate in the minute-to-minute planning also increases as you go up gold, silver, bronze, as you go um, bronze, silver, gold. So a gold-level call is the C-suite. It's the chairman. It's the chief financial officer. It's the treasurer. It's the chief risk officer. It's the head of global trading. It's everybody who's making seven or eight figures sitting at the top of their, their skyscraper in London, New York, Frankfurt, Tokyo, Beijing, you name the place. All of a sudden, what they're focusing on isn't running the bank, it's addressing the, uh, the emergency. And so initiating a gold call when you're interrupting everybody's schedule at the very, very top of your organization is something that the average person would rather not do. It's, it's very similar to uh, deciding you're going to leak non-public information because it has, if you're wrong, it has big-time, long-term, profound impact. You don't want to be a managing director that causes the chief operating officer or the chief executive officer of a, of a Fortune 50 company to stop everything they're doing. You know, that's, we're talking like 
you know, you're stopping a Bill Gates, so you're stopping uh, you know, any of the, the titans, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, and you're saying, stop everything you're doing, pay attention only to me, I'm not joking, you've got to hear this and you've got to participate, drop everything else, and they do, simply on your say-so, then you start briefing them. If you get that wrong, it's what's called in the industry a, cl- a career-limiting move or a CLM, and you only get one of those. Hmm. So that's the, the gold, well, silver, bronze... Um, levels of interaction and crisis response are very real. And uh, if you were to plug those into uh, a uh, browser search engine, you could read more about them. Yeah. Well, what is, um, what's going on in New York and the world that with, with these infected that is leading to these, uh, these problems that, uh, that are called for calling for color coded alerts. When you have a new, unidentified pathogen that is spreading person to person um, and it appears to be already at a global level of dispersion, that's automatically a gold level event because you have something that's affecting personal security or you know the, the physical well-being of the employees and, and the residents of the cities where you live. So that's, that's one. Chet got that. It's globally dispersed. Got that. It's going to involve national level government response. Chet got that and it's going to drive financial activity. Yep, all those things are checked off, and so we're definitely already at a gold-level event and, and all the things that that implies. But what's happening in the book is that the, the bad guy, to this date, still unknown, still not, uh, not explicated, not explained, uh, the bad guy has distributed um, urinal cakes, uh, I guess you call them air, air refreshers for into bathrooms, and has already begun uh, dis, you know, spreading the disease um, is it's airborne, among other things. And so the, the first warning you get that someone's sick and is behaving like a zombie doesn't mean you go to that place and you know, start out with a fence and now you, can, you, know, you may lose a lot of folks inside the fence, but you've contained the virus. It's too late. In, in John's universe, in the Black Tide Rising universe, it's already spread globally. It's, all, it's up and down the East Coast, up and down the West Coast. It's in Asia. It's in Africa. It's in Europe. It's a mess. Now, in John's original book, the, uh, Under a Graveyard Sky, the characters were focusing on what was happening really close to home. Um, in um, The Valley of Shadow, I explained how the intelligence organization is sharing, uh, you know, they've got a, they've got a wider lens uh, you know, so the telephoto is looking at zooming in really tight. They're looking broadly across the entire international banking system and all of their intelligence apparatuses, and they're going, "Huh, we've got a real problem." And this isn't just New York. This isn't just uh, Tokyo. This isn't just the West Coast of the United States. It's everywhere, and that becomes really apparent over the weekend because in the in this universe, I believe Steve Smith gets his uh, his apocalypse call on a Thursday morning when he's teaching history class. And he pulls the chalks right away, and he's in motion and gets a boat by Friday. And um, that means that Tom Smith had to begin getting an inkling of this on Tuesday or Wednesday, which is what happens in the book. Because on the weekend, typically when things shut down, the bank's just spinning up into its highest level, its highest gear, if you will. And uh, folks are working really hard to understand what is the scope of this emergency, how do we respond, what are the next steps. And one of the first things that... John's characters do is they bring in experts, which again, like real life, um, large corporations retain specialists of all sorts, in this case, uh, virologists, that can advise them and decode some of the, uh, the techno babble that comes out of the CDC and, and so forth and explains what does that mean in black and white terms and how do we respond to this. And so we got that. Yeah. We have the character, uh, Dr. Curry. What doctor? What part of evil scientist don't you understand, Curry? That John wrote into Under a Graveyard Sky. He's a great character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love that he apologizes for his southern drawl all the time too. And he's a big fan of, uh, of popcorn. Yeah. That, oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So and um, he immediately sees that this is a. Uh, this is a created thing that it's a bio bio warfare kind of move. Um, are we, we're not at the beginning seeing, um, zombies stumbling, shambling about in New York city, um, quite yet. Are we, I mean, we've seen some, right. And 
Mike has to face Mike. Uh, Tom has to face one um, relatively soon in, in the uh, at the beginning of the book, which he does. Um, he does. He loses uh, one of the members of his team gets uh, gets infected, and um, because of all the different ways that the virus can be transmitted aren't fully understood. And uh, if you get a little scratch or a little cut, and the virus gets in there it radically shortens the incubation period, and the emergence of symptoms can happen very, very rapidly. Uh, in fact, there's a, a number of really interesting characters that John um, created that we don't get to see again. And one of them is a young police officer uh, who interacts with Steve Smith and his family. And then we get to see that young officer coping with how do you perform law enforcement when the persons you're trying to serve and protect are lethally infected and rapidly aggressive. And if you get bit, you turn into one of them. So how do you how do you work around that? And uh, this young cop has a, a really tough tough time of it. And then because he stays on land, he disappears from the rest of of the books. Well, he uh, he's revisited in the books that John and I uh, have written. So we have the Valley of Shadows, but the sequel is already re- is already written. And uh, I think Bane's going to release a schedule for that sometime next year. Oh yeah, well it's uh, it's going to be a summer book. Um, I believe it's, uh, it's July or August. Um, it's already on the on the schedule. Super. So yeah, that's the. Uh, it's hard. It's it, one of the things that people struggle with in real life is determining. Hey, am I in an emergency? Is this is this going to require me to make decisions differently than I usually do? And people have a really strong emotional inertia. They want to pretend that things are okay. There's a hurricane coming. Well, I'm not going to leave. It's too much trouble. It's always it's going to blow over. It's not a big deal. Even if it blows really hard, I'll be fine in my house. And they don't want to acknowledge the existence of an emergency. And it's think of it as sort of keep calm and carry on on steroids. And after a certain point, that kind of response is actually contra survival. And so in this book, and in John's books, you see people who don't survive, who cling to that, desperately cling to that hope. Things are going to blow over. Things are going to be normal. It's going to be okay. When, in fact, the only way they're going to survive is recognizing, hey, we're in a real crisis. We've got to change what we're doing. We've got to change radically how we're going to live, how we're going to respond. And some folks, again, in, in real life, just aren't capable of making that switch. And it's, it's, it's tragic, actually. It's, a, it's a, a survival adaptation that I think we've begun to lose in our society. Hmm. I mean, if you're if you're out in the Serengeti and you sort of you know try to uh, startle uh, a springbuck or a gazelle, it hauls ass. It doesn't stop them. Look at you, like, are you a threat? No, they they flat out head for the horizon. Um, that sort of startle reflex, that immediately you know fight or flee, is has begun to be sort of culturally bred out of um, people, and that's really unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's a cultural. Uh... It dampening down on something that's that's basic to us, perhaps. That, uh... I could go on. And if you're in New York and you see a you see a, a street robbing or a fight, people don't run up to intervene and pull them apart. They really, they run up with their phones and try and film it so they can put it on Instagram. Now it's become you know, emergencies and and catastrophes as entertainment or a chance to you know get a good blog post. It's it's actually worse than yeah. I had first uh, postulated. Well, it seems like I think for a lot of people, they think that documenting something is action <laughs> when it's not. You know, it's like not. It's absolutely not. Um, and uh, in in these books, people that mis- you know, make that mistake uh, are often um, playing the role of the first body discovered. So, um, so uh, Tom does not make this mistake in the book, and um, it, although he's he's he has to agonize over when to call in what, um, and there are other emergency response uh, teams and and people go, that are becoming engaged with this, and there's a real interesting sort of amalgamation of of folks that come together to do something about this, and they're not who you might expect. Although there is the Office of Emergency Management, um, so tell us about uh, another character who I kind of like because he's kind of like a a good guy sociopath, um, which you don't see very often. Um, jo- Joanna Cohn. So 
So Joanna Cohn is the director of the Office of Emergency Management for the city of New York, which is a very senior level position and become even even more influential and more senior and has a greater budget in the real world as as uh, emergencies and, and climate uh, climate events have pummeled New York and the and tri state region. But in the book, um, she's a 9/11 survivor, and she's in QR. There's something not quite right about Joanna, and she has an agenda. And as long as she can turn her, let's call it, um, professional aspirations and goals in a direction that benefits the city, if you will, things work out pretty well. You know, her motivations, as long as she's doing things that are kind of constructive, it all kind of works out. But uh, she doesn't regard the potential fall of civilization or the absence of rule of law or the death of the mayor, those aren't bad things to Joanna. Those are opportunities. And as these things are, as the, as the crisis deepens, because she is who she is and has a role that she has, she's interacting with and actually teaming with uh, Tom Smith and the other banks that are running sort of the, if you will, the commercial side of the response to this disaster. And they're also partnered with the New York City Police Department, which, again, is something that would happen in real life. And they're also partnered with uh, a rather unusual, let's call them um, an entrepreneurial element that we would, you know, in good times, would just call criminals uh, that have a network and know how to, you know, how to run an economy that's not the official economy. Because if you're dealing in um, the sourcing, manufacture, and distribution of vaccine, which can't be you know, legally and lawfully acknowledged, you need to work with people that are comfortable conducting business where the streetlights don't shine. And so they need someone like Frank Matricardi. They need uh, someone to provide discipline like, um, uh, like uh, uh, Captain Dominguez of the NYPD, the first, uh, first precinct. And they need someone who understands the emergency side of things for the, the, uh, the city, but who is, um, let's call it morally flexible, and that would be Joanna. So this quartet forms the heart, if you will, of a cartel, that's trying to manufacture vaccine illegally, but critically in, in volumes enough to prevent the fall of the city, to keep things running long enough, to keep that economy running, to keep the banks operating, to keep money flowing, to keep things normal enough that everybody contributes long enough for the big pharma companies, the Eli Lillies of the world and so forth, make vaccine in huge global quantities. But the, it takes a long time to do that. You can't do it in a few weeks or even in a month. And while you're waiting, you have to find a shortcut. And they've come up with a shortcut, but it's not a very lawful shortcut, and it's arguably not a very ethical shortcut, but they think they can yeah. make it work. And it's all four of these disparate groups coming together where normally they wouldn't necessarily be particularly close. Yeah, and it happens fairly early in the book, so I think we could, we're not really spoiling it to say uh, what the moral quandary is. Um, and, and Joanna has no moral quandary about this. <laughs> she, she just, her basic is like, how can I convince these idiots? <laughs> and everybody else. She isn't in it for the money. She's in it for the power. The, the gangsters are in it for the money. Uh, the cops are in it for law and order because they, they believe. And the banks are in it because they understand the global picture that if this, if they fall here, it falls everywhere. And it's the end. It's, it's, it's the long night. It's the end of civilization as we know it, this go-around. And so they're all operating from different perspectives. And um, I was so tickled when John read the manuscript uh, on the first go-through and goes, oh, I see what you've done. And he identified correctly that normally you think that you could trust, you know, you, you would look at that, that party of four people and those four organizations and say, okay, these are going to be the natural allies and the natural antagonists. And I deliberately turned that on its head. I don't want to give give too much away, um, but as the city devolves slowly but faster and faster into chaos, this quartet, this cartel, comes under tremendous strain, And because they're all, maybe except for Joanna, they're all human people, if you will. Now, she's human, but she's not, like I said, she's not quite right. She's, a, she's some Harvard neuropsychiatrist's uh, thesis paper that hasn't been written yet. And uh, then, you know, how, how are they going to collaborate? How is this going to come to an end the night the lights go out in New York, the night of the last concert at Washington Square Park? What happens then? 
Mm-hmm. And there's a, it's a long, slow buildup. It's like watching a snowball go downhill. At first, it's very small and not moving very fast. But at the bottom of the hill, you know, it's four, pun- it's four tons of, of uh, packed ice doing 60 miles an hour. Don't be next to it. You're dead. And so they're trying to gauge the right moment for when do you hop off this ball or try and divert this ice ball. And they don't always necessarily agree on when that's going to be. That was the first part of an interview talking with Mike Massa about the Valley of Shadows. Part two will be available on next week's podcast. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. Chapter 11 Twenty-five years ago It was hard work to mop up so much blood. Luckily, there had been so many opportunities to practice lately that he'd become very good at it. He may have only been a child of the non-people, and a small, sickly one at that, but you didn't need to be strong to clean up blood, only committed. When he was done, the stone floors were so clean you couldn't even tell that a man had just been gutted there like a pig. He had been doing such a good job at scrubbing up the blood that the overseer had not had him beaten even once over the last few weeks. After the whole men had stormed out in frustration, and the other castless had carried the dead warrior's body outside for cremation, the boy found himself alone in the main chamber of the great house Fidal, on his hands and knees, pushing a red puddle. Only he wasn't really alone. The sword was there, watching him. Wringing out his rag over the bucket, he saw that the water running over his hands was still very pink. There was much work to do. When the Thakur of House Fidal had died, they had placed his terrible magic sword in the main chamber. Castless did not usually live as long as whole men, but there were a few among them old enough to remember the last time this had happened. They warned the other Castless what to expect. Until the ancestor blade was satisfied, the whole men of the warrior caste would be tense and quick to anger. Do your jobs. Stay out of sight. The warrior caste loved to spill blood, but they considered it beneath them to mop it off the floors. That was unclean. Even the lowest of the workers thought that they were too good to play with corpses and blood and guts. That was work for the castless, so some of them would be sent into the main chamber. If they were chosen, look only at the ground. Do not speak unless spoken to. If they were lucky, they would not be killed by frustrated warriors. If the forgotten had mercy on them, the sword would pick someone sooner rather than later, and life could return to normal. It had not taken long for the sword to begin killing whole men. That last Thakur's ashes were still warm, 
when the first of the warrior caste tried to take up the sword. A few minutes later, the overseer had arrived in the castless quarter, looking for help to remove the body parts. Why take the boy? his mother asked. The overseer frowned. Why not? He's weak. He'll just be in the house slave's way. The overseer was castless as well, but even among the non-people, there was order, and questioning his commands could lead to a beating, or worse. The overseer seems like a huge, muscled beast to the small child, especially when he roughly grabbed the boy by the wrists. I got strong men for lifting bodies. He's got small fingers to get into the cracks. I don't want no stained mortar, and I don't want the main chamber stinking of death. Got it? His mother had lowered her head in submission. The castless did as they were told. They worked and they died at the pleasure of their betters. That's how it always had been, and how it always would be. Such was the way of the non-people. The overseer had given him a rag and a bucket. They were his most prized possessions. The first time he had entered the main chamber, he had tried to heed the elder's warning, but he had been too tempted and had lifted his head to see. The inside of the great house was truly as amazing as the house slaves proclaimed it to be. The floors were flat stone, not dirt. The walls did not have holes in them. And in fact, they were covered in carvings and paintings of animals and birds, mountains and trees, and heroic scenes of warriors defeating demons. There was food everywhere. This one room was big enough to hold ten castless barracks, it was more than he could comprehend. But it wasn't the vastness of the great house that intimidated him. It was the sword. There was no ceremony to it. The sword was just lying there on the floor, where the last warrior had flung it after severing his own legs. Though there was blood on the walls and the floor, and in every crook and crevice and joint, there wasn't a drop on the sword or anywhere close to it. In time, he would learn that this was normal for the ancestor blade, as it did not want to stain itself with unworthy life, which was good, because the boy was scared to get close to the sword. He'd overheard the warrior caste speak of the dead Thakur's sword. It was said whoever carried it could defeat entire armies by himself, only this kind of sword could easily kill a demon from the distant and terrifying ocean. Even the mightiest heroes were scared of the ancestor blade. The boy took their fear and made it his own. He was castless. The law declared that his kind were not even allowed to touch a weapon. His experience with swords consisted of seeing them in the hands of warriors when it was time to intimidate or execute. This sword was not like those. This one was beautiful. It hurt his eyes, but he couldn't help but look anyway. Realizing that he'd been staring, he'd quickly averted his eyes. There were still warriors present. If a whole man saw a castless looking at the sacred ancestor blade of House Vidal, he'd surely be killed. In this room, his life was worth absolutely nothing. Only the warrior caste did not see him. The castless were typically beneath notice. They were simply there to do the things whole men should not have to. They wrapped the body parts in old blankets and carried them down the stairs to the furnace. He was so small that it was a real struggle to carry just the man's leg, and this one had been cut off at the knee. Then he'd been put to work pushing thick blood around with a rag and carrying buckets of water up and down the stairs until the main chamber was spotless. The overseer had inspected it carefully. If any blood got into a gap and began to rot, he'd have to smoke the smell out with hot coals, and the smoke might upset the great house family. The pale stones took the most scrubbing to keep from staining, it was hard, but it was better than the typical unclean duties of 
tending swine, cleaning sewers, or burning corpses. The first few weeks were very busy, as members of the warrior caste from across all of the lands of House Vidal tried to take up the sword. There was so much blood to clean up that the child found himself working in the main chamber more often than not. The overseer allowed him to stay hidden in there during the day, so he didn't have to walk back and forth to the castle's quarter to fetch laborers. The boy was able to watch many of the warrior's attempts to wield the sword. Few ended in crippling injury or death, but all ended with blood. There was a shadowed alcove in one corner of the main chamber, well hidden behind a few hanging tapestries. The boy squatted there, waiting, his precious rag clean and his bucket filled to the brim with soapy water. He liked this alcove. It was cool out of the sun. There were no biting insects and, best of all, the whole men could not see him, but he could see them. The overseer had dumped a few buckets of wash water over the boy first, so his betters wouldn't detect the pig, ash, and dung smell of the castless. It was the first time he'd observed whole men. The law declared that they were separate and better, but outside their armor shells, the warriors didn't seem so different from the non-people. They were strong and proud until the sword opened them up. Then they screamed and bled the same color as a castless. Above the warriors were the members of the great house. They didn't look so different than his family. Only they were far better fed, wearing real clothing, and carrying themselves without constant fear. But the law said they were superior, so that was the way of things. The house slaves began preparing the chamber by lighting lanterns. That meant that it was time for another attempt. Men in uniform, their station far beyond his understanding, arrived to serve as witnesses. The sword ended up in a different place every time, depending on where the last user had dropped it after it cut him. But the witnesses always stood as far from it as possible, as if it might become angry and cut them as well. The boy knew that was foolish. The sword only judged those who tried to wield it. He was only a castless blood scrubber, and he already understood the sword better than the whole men in the fancy robes. Someone stopped directly in front of his alcove so he could no longer see the proceedings through the gap in the tapestries. He stood up to try and see past them, but his view was being blocked by two people. He didn't dare move the fabric or risk moving enough to slosh any water from his bucket. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And the long, drawn-out morning call of Quirky, the camouflage unicorn of the apocalypse, who is said to urinate pure nitroglycerin. But that may be apocryphal. And thanks, kudos, and more kudos to Mike Massa, co-author with John Ringo of The Valley of Shadows. Please join us next time here at the hammery heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.